Today's date is November 10th, 2022. My name is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Okay. I'm in Virginia Beach having the pleasure of interviewing Thomas Newton. So thank you very much for sitting down and talking to us. Oh, no problem. Yep. If you could just give us a little bit of background about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you graduate high school? Things like that. Okay. I was born in a little town called Tarboro, North Carolina. But my sister, my older sister was born in Trenton, New Jersey. My older brother was born in Harlem Hospital in New York City. So when my mother got ready to have me, she owed money to Harlem Hospital, so she couldn't have me in New York. So she took me to my grandmother down in North Carolina, Tarboro, North Carolina. Okay. And that's where I was born. That's where I was born, so. Okay. Is then, that where you grew up? Uh, eventually, it was during the war, 1940s, 1939, 14. Um, we went back down to North Carolina for grammar school, grade school, okay. and high school. So during those times, it was tough for my mother and father, so we sent us to North Carolina during the school year and all the way back to New York during the summer. Okay. So we knew we had two worlds we could live in, the South and the North. Right. So that was good experience in those days and yeah. everything. So that was happy times and uh, those times and everything was happy time for us, but a little struggle for my mother and father. So yeah. in order to facilitate and uh, to take care of us, they always sent us to my grandmother to go to school, but they make sure that we came back to New York in the summer. Yeah. Well, my grandmother said, I had them during the winter, you take them during the summer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we grew up in uh, North Carolina and New York. Yeah. So Did you like one better than the other? Uh, equally. Yeah. Well, more to do in New York, but down in a small town, you know, it was not too much to do, but we made, when ourselves, my brother, my sister, right. and myself, we made things to do. We were happy in North Carolina. I mean, happy more so in New York, because there's more things to do, okay. more movies to go to. My mother and father always made sure that we would get what we needed and to be disciplined and to instill in us that uh, don't get in trouble. Right. They always say, no trouble, no trouble. I know you're not used to do, be in New York during the summertime and everything, but while you were here, no trouble. Yeah. And we abided by what they told us. Yeah. Did you, um, did you have any family members that were in the military? Yeah, my oldest brother, he was in the military. Okay. Yeah. What branch of the service? He was in the Army. Okay. Yeah, I think he was in Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Fort Leonardwood, Missouri, I think, for a while. Yeah. And then I think he went overseas. I don't know what branch he was. I mean, I don't know where he went. But. Yeah, okay. Do you remember Pearl Harbor? Do you remember that day? Oh, yeah. In I December? remember Pearl Harbor, yeah. Yeah, what do you yeah. remember about that? I remember we were sitting home and uh, we heard uh, FDR speech about uh, bombing Pearl Harbor. And this will uh, be, be in my, our memory forever. Yeah. And that speech and everything. So, yeah. so I was born in 1928, so this is 1940, 39, 40. So yeah. my memory is a little fuzzy, but right. uh, I remember it. But you can remember, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You remember where you were? Were you in New York? Yeah, we yeah. were in New York that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about that? You remember your parent? You were with your parents at the time. Do you yeah. remember what they were thinking, how they reacted? Well, like everybody else, it was in awe. Or it yeah. couldn't happen. Right. What happened and everything. So they would always talk about it. And uh, then uh, we could go to uh, in New York. We could go to the uh, movie and see the the uh, movie reels and everything about yeah. the war and everything about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. That was very vivid in my memory because we can see the planes coming over and yeah. all the f f uh, fire and everything and the yeah. sinking of the ships and everything. Yeah. So I have a pretty good memory of that. Yeah, it's something you don't forget. Right. Mm -hmm. no. At some point you joined the military, correct? Yes, in 1946. Yeah. I joined the military. After high school, I joined the military. And they sent me to Shepherdfield, Texas for basic training. Okay. 
after basic training. When I joined the military, I told a recruiting officer I wanted to be an airplane mechanic. Say no problem. So when I finished basic training, right. the recruiting officer, I mean the uh, placement officer, looked at my uh, score and I said, oh, 137. He said, over there. I said, I was told I could go to, to school for airplane mechanic. He said, over there. I said, what's over there? He said, you're going to clerk type of school in Denver, Colorado. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I called my mother and told her, she said, make the best of it. Yeah. So after I finished clerk typing school, trying to learn how to type and get my brains synchronized with my fingers. Right. So after what, six weeks, uh, I finally managed to type 45 words a minute in order to graduate from that. And then they sent me to Columbus, Ohio, Lockburn Air Force Base. Now, Lockburn Air Force Base had been closed because uh, during the war they didn't need it no more. Right. So let me uh, put a little background on that. Uh, in Freeman Field in Indiana, they had a, a after the war, some pilots want to not fly single engine planes and all, so he went to, they sent us to, sent them to Freeman Field in Indiana right. for B-25 training. So they promised them separate but equal quarters. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It was separate, but it wasn't equal. So these uh, 101 pilots and enlisted men, the pilots decided that they were going to go to the uh, White Officer Club. So they went five one day and then a couple of days later, 10 would go try to get into the club. So they uh, barred them and had them ask them to sign a paper waiver that they would abide by what's on the base. They put the commander demanded of them on the base. Right. They refused to sign. So they charged them with mutiny. And when they charged them with mutiny and everything, they decided that uh, two or three of them was sort of adamant about not being able to go to the club. So they decided that they would send them back to Godman Field, 101 officers, and they list them in back to Godman Field. So that was in 1945. So when they got to Godman Field, the Air Force was wondering, what are we going to do to these guys? They came from overseas. They were self-sustaining overseas because they had their own base. Everything is separate in these days, you know, it's segregation. Right. So they had gone through all these things overseas and everything, distinguished themselves by escorting bombers into Germany and back. Right. So here they are in and Field and everything, and they didn't have adequate quarters. So that's why they wanted to go to the White Officers Club. Right. So. They, Anyway, what happened was they sent them back to Godman Field. Now in six months, what are we going to do with these guys? These are all experienced guys. Right. Fought the war, distinguished themselves, and what are we going to do with them? So since uh, Lockburn Air Force Base was vacant, they sent all these officers and the enlisted men to Lockburn Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio. And here I come, out and after I finished clerk type of school, I came in May to Columbus, Ohio. I didn't know that Columbus, Ohio, with Lockwood Air Force Base at that time, was a black, it was all black. But they had just gotten there. They didn't have quarters. They was, had to open up everything on the base, the mess hall and everything, the carpool, everything they had to open up. But they had experience from overseas because they was a separate unit overseas also. So we had everybody, the tower operator, truck control tower operator, or the, or the motor pool, mm -hmm. everything on a base, they knew how to do. So Billion Old Davis Jr. was the commanding officer. So he uh, instilled in us, when we got there, everybody has a job to do. They put us here thinking that we would fail because we just wanted 
to be a part of the facilities that the white soldiers have, the White House and everything. So we are here on Lockburn Air Force Base in 1946. So Mr. Old Davis said, we are here, we got a job to do, and each one of us going to show our pride. We're going to be a proud service on this base. They had the 99th Fighter Squadron, the 301st, and the 100th Fighter Squadron. And they had the 301st was the bomber group who had was supposed to go to Indiana for bomber training. Okay. So they didn't, the bombers didn't fight in the war, but the 99th and 101st and 301st fought in the war. So uh, being an old Davis instilled in all of us, we got a job to do, do your job. Right. We gonna show the Air Force what we can do, despite being discriminated against, mm -hmm. despite our lack of, their lack of uh, interest in us, we are gonna do a job here. We'll exemplify everything that instilled in us and every man on that base had the pride to make Vision Old Davis Jr.'s operation on that base a thing that we could all be proud of. And I was there for three years. And I was so proud that I could look out the window or go down the flight line and see these pilots flying these airplanes coming back in. And those were some good times for me because 18 years old, 19 years old. At first, I was in the operation headquarters of the 99th Fighter Squadron doing the morning report. Yeah. And then eventually, I was doing the flight line of, as a supply sergeant. So, anyway, I was, could, I was young. And I wanted to know everything that I could know about these officers and everything, what they did during the war, and uh, how long they was in and everything. So, I met some of the officers. Like, oh, Chappy James, uh, Charles Dryden, William A. Campbell, all those guys that distinguished themselves during the war. Mm -hmm. So my experience in Lockburn for my three years there was one that uh, I was very proud of. And even today, I can say that I was in Lockburn Air Force Base and they're one of the best bases that they said later on, one of the best bases in the Air Force because of uh, what they had done and what they accomplished. Yeah. And after they integrated in 1949, 48, then I, I got out in 1949, but my time spent there was rewarding because yeah. I was among these guys that had distinguished themselves and I didn't want to do anything to uh, Bring right. reflect a negative on what we were doing at Lock Run Effort. So everybody had a, a, a common interest. So we're going to make Benjamin Noah Davis one of the best commanding officers on the base, and they did. Yeah. And uh, whatever we did, we did with pride. We would walk straight. Yeah. Somebody come on the base, they would come on the base sometimes uh, for. Uh, to see the parades and everything like that, the white people would come in town and everything. But at first, they didn't want this base on in Columbus, Ohio. Right. Because of those days, you know, everybody, would, um, or all the people in the government was white and everything. They had these black guys coming over here, so they didn't want that at first. But after the base was established and all this money came in from, from the base and everything, they were happy. Yeah. And every time they would come out to the base, when we had some uh, operations going on and everything, like we had a flyover, or the black pilots and everything. And they were happy to see that and everything. So eventually they th did support what we were doing on the base and everything. Right. So I had a lot of experience. I can remember in 1946 I got there. In the latter part of 1946, they had uh, committed to go to Blythe, California. So uh, the 20 airplanes was going to go to Blythe, California. I was in supply at that time. And uh, we had to go three days ahead of time to Blythe, California, about 265 miles outside of Los Angeles. Right. 
in the desert. So we got there three days ahead of time. So that was my first fight on an aircraft. This old big C-47 with two wings. Right. And it was raining like crazy this morning. I thought, oh, we're not going to play today. So it was about 6 o'clock. Everybody on the flight line that's going, we got on the plane and everything. And we got the one, I was sitting next to the chaplain. So <laughs> on our way, we hit an air pocket. Zoom down, you know. Right. And the chaplain looked at me. I looked at him. So I said, what's this? He said, that's what you pull <laughs> in case something happens, you know. So we got to Blythe, California. Now, mind you, that nobody, all these, they had a skeleton crew on the base. The base was small, it had been closed. Yeah. So all these guys on the base and everything, we see, we come in three days ahead of time. What are you guys doing here? You wait and see. You'll see. We're here for the maneuvers. So three days later, here come these 12 airplanes. Single engine, P-47s, landing, one after the other, one after the other. So uh, we was on the flight line, and all the mechanics and out there go out there to that plane and everything, security plane, shock them and everything. And then these pilots, they waited to the last one had uh, landed and everything, security planes and everything. Right. They walking towards the operation room. So these white guys say, hey, what, are those colored guys? So we just, we just listen. So, said, man, they can fly planes? What do you see? So one of the guys say, they fly planes. Listen, just like everybody else. What do you think? All we need is a chance. Every, all we need is a chance. We can do anything you can do. And after that, every morning, every afternoon, when they leave to go up to Catalina Island, whatever they was doing out there, shooting targets and everything. When they come back, those guys would come and reckon them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. But at first, they didn't want to salute right. these officers and everything. But they learned that they had abilities just as the white guys did. And when we left, everybody on the flight line, or they came out, and they were, every time a plane take off, they were clapping or the experience we had, you know. Right, right. So uh, those were uh, the times that uh, I felt that, uh, you know, we are doing something for our country. But we don't get the praise, we don't get the recognition, everything that the white guys did. Mm -hmm. What we did, what every white pilot did, what every other group did, we were as good as they were. In, in the war, uh, they lost 66 airmen from the 332nd Fighter Group, and they had 26 prisoners of war. And uh, during that time and everything, they were at a separate base in Yugoslavia, so they had to fly over to where the bombers were taken off, and they would escort them to, into Germany and back. And their work record was they had less bomber attacks than any other group had previously escorted the bombers into Germany and back. Because of that, they had their plane red tails. They had plane the tails on the plane red. and the, the, So they didn't know who was escorting them in and out. But one day, one of the planes was disabled, so they was forced to land in Yugoslavia where the 332nd and 99th Fighter Squadron was. Mm -hmm. and that's when they realized that these red tail guys were actually black guys that was protecting them bombers into Germany and back. Yeah. That's when they learned. And that's when the publicity was, hey, those guys that we see, those red tails, we, when we see those guys coming, we can relax. Well, we know they're going to Berlin and they're going to protect us. And they shot down a hundred and I think it was 133 German aircraft. Wow. They uh, a hundred and something on the ground. A thousand box cars they disabled and everything. 
and one destroyer. They sank one destroyer. But all his accomplishments were the guys that I am now looking at. All these guys from overseas is on Lockwood Air Force Base that I have read about. But now I'm among these guys. And I told my mother, she was so proud, you know, that yeah. you, you got history here, you know. Always, always, long as you live, be glad that you was in a place that you could learn and you could see people, real people that you know, yeah. real people that you can talk to. And just like everything else, it's a struggle. But those guys at Lockwood Air Force Base, they made Benjamin O. Davis proud. And one of the other features I thought, I thought about oh, the, a couple of years ago, 20, 20, 2020, I think it was, my son lives in uh, Plant City, Florida, so every year they have a strawberry festival down there. So uh, some people from McDill Field came over, the officers came over and everything. So they put me and my wife in the parade, you know, 1957 yeah. Chevrolet. That was the first car I ever owned. And uh, they had us in the parade and everything. So one of the officers was from McDill Field. Say, Mr. Newton, Dutch, Sergeant Newton, would you come over to uh, MacDill Field and talk to our troops and everything? I said, be happy to. So my son took me over there and uh, we talked to the troops. So in MacDill Field, they have a conference room for Benjamin O. Davis Jr., a conference room dedicated to him. Yeah. And uh, I was able to, I got a picture I was able to uh, stand under his picture and talk, tell the enlisted men and the officers at MacDill Field of my experience with Benjamin O. Davis Jr. at Lockwood Air Force Base. Wow. And so I was proud of that because I remember when he was a colonel on Lockwood Air Force Base and how proud he was. And I'm standing under this picture looking up at him on this big old wall up here. At, McDill Field. That's what they got right now. So when I go back, I'll probably go back this year and next year in March to the Strawberry Festival. I go back over there. Okay. You know, let's let's look at him. So I remember mm -hmm. all the things that we went through, what he's accomplished. Finally, finally made him a four-star general. Yeah. Yep. So wow. all those things came from Lockburn Air Force Base. That's what we knew. But suppose we had a fail. Suppose yeah. we had failed, you know. We didn't fail because we know that things was against us anyway, so we had to overcome it. Yeah. And that's what we did. We overcame it. And those things that came after that, when they integrated the service and everything, all these powers had more opportunity to integrate into the white units and everything, and they distinguished themselves in the white unit. Like Daniel Chapter James, if you could read his life, his biography, he was one of the pilots from North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Japan, and he was a big guy. He was too big for the, uh, the P-47s, but he did. And then he changed over to the B-50, B-25. But his accomplishments and everything made him a four-star general. He was a four-star general before Davis got his four, four stars and everything. Yeah. But a lot of guys come out of there that uh, always uh, distinguished themselves after Lockburn. I can think of uh, Thomas uh, Warren Jefferson. I can think of Harold Brown. All these guys, you can look it up. And they could see they came out of Lockburn. And when I can read something and come across a name that I can remember and everything, oh yeah, he was in Lockburn. Yeah. I remember those guys. But they were all dedicated to Lockburn. Yeah. The, set, set, the safety record at Lockburn was excellent. Excellent. Even the guys in control tower and everything, right. they did their job. They kept the planes apart and everything. 
So that's more or less uh, what I, how I served. And like I told you, I came after the war. What, what month did you enlist? Wait, Do you remember what month you enlisted? I enlisted in uh, January. Of 1946? January 1946. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like I told you, I went to clerk type of school reluctantly. <laughs> and I got out in 1949. What, um, you, you were a supply sergeant? Yeah. What, did that, what, what was your job? What did you have to do? I have to, uh, when a mechanic comes in and says, I need a strut, I need a gyroscope, or anything for a plane, I have to secure it. I have to go to base supply if they didn't have it. We had books, schematics of planes and everything. So I could, he said, I kind of come in and say, I need this. I have to look it up, see what it is and everything. I go to base supply. They didn't have it there. Then we had to order it. Yeah. So we had to order it from books. We don't have <coughs> computers like they do now. So we have to order from books and everything. So we was able to uh, facilitate that to get the plane Okay. Serviceable and everything for what they needed and everything. So that was my job. When they needed something, I had to f find it. I had to uh, secure it, and I had to uh, give it back to the give it to the mechanic so he can keep these planes in good working order. Like I say, I was, the safety record was excellent because everyone did what they supposed to do. So they say, Hey, Newt. This plane can't be out in four days now. Right. What can you do? You gotta get the you gotta get whatever I need in there. Okay. So that spurred me on to do my job. Right. So if I did my job, he could do his job. Yeah. The pilot could do that be safe, do their job. So that's what I did, uh, my part. Right. To secure the parts for the planes. Yeah. Are there any incidents while you were there? Anything that stands out about your time there? Oh, there was a lot, probably, that, yeah. well, that you went know, on. Yeah, well, nothing negative. Yeah, nothing negative. On the base, no, nothing negative on the base. But uh, some farm rumors I had, you know, Ken, uh, Kennedy Airport, uh, airport uh, what's the name of the airport in uh, New York City? Uh, LaGuardia? No, not like LaGuardia, the other. Um, JFK? Yeah. Of course, it wasn't JFK then. JFK, yeah. yeah. Well, it was out a while in those days. Yeah. And uh, our planes had took part in that, so they flew us up to Stewart Field in New York City. Okay. I mean, outside of New York City, Stewart Field. And our planes had to go into this and search and uh, do our flyover with the rest of the planes from all over the country. So it was out a while at that time. Now it's JFK Airport. Gotcha. But on the base, on my, I can say that uh, I don't have too many, too many negative things yeah. to say and everything. We all got along. Did you keep in touch with any of the guys after you got out? Did you keep, still keep in touch with any of them? Yeah, I did. You got I, out? I can remember one, uh, Buford A. Johnson. Okay. He was a mechanic. And for a while, you know, we used to correspond and everything. But Buford A. Johnson was a airplane mechanic. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the, every mechanic looked up to him because he could die and there was a situation for an airplane. Right. And now, uh, then, you know, he was in our barrack and about two beds down from me and everything. So we used to talk and everything. Oh, he was, he uh, was uh, from Alabama, I think he was. And uh, he uh, was a studious guy. He always was reading, you know, everything. So. I gravitate to him because I like to read a lot too. Yeah. So anyway, if anybody could pull up Buford A. Johnson, 99th Fighter Squad, they tell you all about his career after he left Lockburn and everything. Right. Buford A. Johnson, he was a master mechanic when they integrated. <coughs> he was the first <coughs> black mechanic to work on a jet after integration. He was the first black mechanic to work on a jet. And anybody can Google that and see what it was. Yeah. Well, he 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 was one guy that had the ability for everybody that would go to him and ask him, "What do you think about this?" And he'd always had an answer in there. 
So <clears throat> we uh, had a contact for you know, about six months after I got out and everything. And then, <clears throat> you know, we sort of drifted apart. And uh, my mother had told me, when you, you got three years in, you can get the GI Bill, come home and go to school. So when I came home, I went to Fordham University, but I didn't graduate, but I did go. And uh, after that, I went in the U.S. Post Office for 33 years. And I rose to a station manager, managing 63 employees. Mm -hmm. And I retired in, uh, I retired. Yeah. How do you think your 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 time in the military has has affected who you are now? Greatly. Yeah. Greatly. It made me. I grew up in the Lockwood Air Force. Well, I'm 18. Yeah. Get out at 21. So it affected my life greatly because it taught me self-reliance. It taught me how to respect other people, mm -hmm. respect their opinions, respect what they go through, and. Uh, being in an all-black unit and everything, we are united what our goal is and everything. So they taught me, whatever you do, you know, there's somebody else in a situation that maybe not the same as yours, but respect them for what right. they are. Always respect the other person, you know, because yeah. you never know what they know. They don't know what I know. Yeah. They don't know how to treat people. But in the military, they treat you all these things, you know, if you wait, if you're willing to listen. And like my mother always told us, make it do your best. Mm -hmm. She'd always say, do your well, I would call and tell them about the do your best. Yeah. And even now, at almost 95 years old in January, I always say, wow. do your best. Whatever it is, do your best, you know. And like you said, in the military, what I took out of it was how to rely on other people because you're all there together, you know. They rely on you, you rely on them. Right. You got the same goal. Right. And that's what we had at Lock Run Air Force for you, yeah. for the same goal, well, to well, make it work. Why did you decide to join the military? Well, out of high school and everything, my father' worst regret all his life was, in those days he didn't have a decent job. He was a truck driver, yeah. that he could send my sister to college because she was valedictorian of her class, okay. and it always bothered him that he couldn't send her to college. So. Uh, one thing that I felt after I graduated from high school was that I can further my education if I go in the military, come yeah. out, my GI Bill, and that's what my father agreed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what motivated me to join the Air Force. Yeah. And uh, it was a great experience. It sounds like it, yeah. And I would... Uh, not traded for anything. If I was uh, younger now, I'd join again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I tell, when I go to talk to these, the on the Air Force base and everything, like Lane and all them, I tell them all that. You got a good job now. All you got to do is do your job, do what you're supposed to do and everything. So I said, these are different times. You know, we had it rough, but you got it easy now, you know? Yeah. I was impressed when. I went over to McDill Field, this young lady, she's 30 years old. And they uh, put me in a simulator and everything, showed me how everything worked. The young lady said, uh, Mr. Newton, I said, what do you do? She said, well, you see the airplanes? We are the squadron that refuel airplanes in flight. Okay. I said, what do you do? She said, you want me to show you, could you come down here? I said, I'm not going down there, I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this young lady, 30 some years old, was responsible for the boom, operating the boom, yep. that the fighter, the planes come up to and she operate this boom. 
make sure that everything is lined up. She talks to the pilot and everything. And I said, that's what you do? She said, yes, sir. I said, oh my, oh my. She said, I love what I do because they depend on me to get that fuel. And I, everybody knew that job. And I was impressed with a lot of young people over in back there that are pilots, guys 35 years old, black guys and everything, you know. They took me around the base and everything, you know. They told me, oh, yo, what they do. They put me in a simulator, so where you want to go? And I said, oh, take me to Hudson River, New York City. Take me down to Hudson River. Maybe I might spot my house. <laughs> and the simulator said, where would you like to go now? I said, take me to Hawaii. And the simulator take you to Hawaii. Where you want to go? These things, you know, I was so happy that I had joined the Air Force. Oh, they got all this stuff nowadays that we didn't have. So there's some proud times in those days, you know, that uh, and I look back, I say, I was a proud, I was proud of where I was at 18 years old. Yeah. Or where I was at 19, 20 years old. He said, no way, I don't know what would happened to me if I hadn't joined the Air Force and everything. Yeah. So I mean, for black kids in them days, they didn't have too many jobs. So my father say, you want to go to the Air Force? Okay. But when you come out, you listen to your mother, you got to go to school. Okay. I did. That's what I did. What advice would you give somebody that might watch this inter interview in a hundred years? What advice would you like to send them? I would like to say to anybody that watches this, you know, whatever, your, whatever you do in life, remember, you are not here individually. There are other people that depend on you. Yeah other people that surround you, other people that admire you. So don't get negative about anything. Always be positive. Always be positive. Yeah. So if you're young today and uh, you want to do some things in your life, you don't know where it's going and everything, you can't decide. I would tell everybody, join the, join the armed services, especially the Air Force, yeah. and because and you feel young, like I was. I grew up in Lockwood Air Force Base around people that I had admired, I had wrote, <coughs> I had uh, read about and everything. And whatever your job, whatever your job is, be proud of what you can accomplish. Look back and say, I did that. And look how it turned out. It turned out real, whatever your job is. Whatever you do, right. be proud of whatever you did, you know. If you uh, pick apples, pick the best apples and say, I picked that. Whatever you do, make sure that you are doing your best, whatever it is. Yeah. That's what I would tell everybody, do your best. When you do your best, you can be proud of yourself. Well, I thank you, sir, for sitting down with us. Uh, uh, and on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Experience, thank you for your service to your country. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you and, and get to hear your story. Okay. So, so thank you.